Watching him come off a screen into a mid-range pull-up was poetry in motion. He had a smooth game and knew how to let the offense come to him. He was an NBA-ready point guard from his first game in the league and could score or pass with the best of them. He tends to be overshadowed by being one of many great players on a Kings team that was defined by their ability to play team basketball. He would have his best years as that same Kings team began to crumble. And after that, he would be given much lesser roles for the remainder of his career. But Mike Bibby was never one to complain about his role, as winning was paramount, and he would do whatever was needed to accomplish that. Unfortunately, so many great regular seasons would be tainted by some inconsistent playoff performances, but it never affected his confidence and desire to take the big shot when he needed to. He was a good point guard that couldn't quite reach the same level as the great players at his position during his era, but that wouldn't take away from how integral he was to success of each team he was on. And once he got out of Vancouver, it was almost a lock that any team he was on would be playing in the postseason. He was never able to get a ring, but was part of some great Kings teams that got close. And it's fair to say that they likely wouldn't have been in the position they were in if they didn't have Mike Bibby running the point. And that's why he's the focus of today's episode. Let's jog your memory. Basketball ran in the family, as Mike Bibby's father Henry was a 9-year NBA veteran who won the NBA championship with the New York Knicks during his rookie season. Mike Bibby attended Shadow Mountain High School in Phoenix, Arizona. During his time there, he established himself as a top player in the nation, as he was named Mr. Basketball USA as a senior, as well as a first-team parade All-American. He would lead Shadow Mountain to their first state championship in 1996, and would be selected to play in the McDonald's All-American game. Bibby would choose to attend the University of Arizona, which was reportedly influenced by conflict between him and his father, who at the time was the head coach at USC. So Bibby would play for Hall of Fame coach Lute Olsen. He joined a great Wildcats team featuring future NBA talent like Jason Terry and Michael Dickerson, as well as Miles Simon and AJ Bramlett. The Wildcats were in need of a point guard after losing senior Reggie Gary, and Bibby would fill that void immediately. He came in as a freshman starter and would finish third in scoring, second in steals, and first in assists. The Wildcats had no issues putting the ball in the basket, as they had the third ranked scoring offense in the nation, but their defense would be their weakness, as they had the 226th ranked scoring defense. The regular season would have ups and downs, as they would lose to five unranked teams, including USC, coached by Bibby's father, and they really struggled in conference play, as they went just 11-7 to finish 5th in the Pac-10, but their 25-9 record still had them ranked 15th in the nation at season's end, as they entered the tournament as a 4 seed. They would win their first round matchup in a comeback versus South Alabama, with Bibby putting up 13 points. They would orchestrate another comeback to defeat Charleston in round 2, as Bibby put up 18 points. The Sweet 16 brought one seed Kansas, with Ray LaFrance and Paul Pierce, and Arizona pulled off the upset, with Bibby putting up a team high 21 points and 5 assists. The Elite 8 would be another close overtime win versus Providence, as Bibby would have 17 points and 4 assists. And the Final Four brought another one seed in North Carolina, led by Vince Carter and Antoine Jameson. But Arizona would pull off another upset and beat their second top seeded team of the tourney, with Bibby putting up 20 points with 6 made threes. The final test came against top seeded defending national champion Kentucky, and Arizona would complete the Cinderella run with a 5 point victory to win the title. Bibby would play well with 19 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 steals, but would commit 8 turnovers. But the Wildcats had won the national championship, and had done so by becoming the first and only team to defeat 3 one seeds. And for his freshman season, Bibby would average about 13.5 points, 3 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2 steals per game, as he was named Pac-10 Freshman of the Year. Going into 1998, there was no reason to believe Arizona couldn't repeat as they were bringing back all five starters and sixth man Jason Terry. Arizona began the year ranked number one, but would lose to number two ranked Kansas and number three ranked Duke within the first six games of the year. Bibby had improved his play as he would be second on the team in scoring and first in assists and steals. After 10 games, the Wildcats were sitting at 7-3, but would go on a 19 game win streak before losing to USC in the second last game of the year but they would end the season with the win to finish ranked number 2 in the nation with a 27-4 record and would enter the tournament as a 1 seed. The Wildcats ran through the first two rounds versus Nichols State and Illinois State, with Bibby averaging 19 points and 5 assists across the first two rounds. The Sweet 16 would be a closer game versus Maryland, which Arizona would win behind Bibby's game-high 26 points on 7-12 of 12 from the field. 
but their title defense came to an end in the Elite Eight versus Utah, as Bibby had one of his worst games as a Wildcat, putting up just 7 points on 3 of 15 shooting, in a blowout loss. As Arizona's top 3 scorers from the regular season scored a combined 19 points, with none of them shooting over 20%. So Bibby's sophomore season ended with him averaging about 17 points, 3 rebounds, 5.5 assists, and 2.5 and steals, as he would be named the Pac-10 Player of the Year and a consensus first-team All-American. Arizona would be losing two starters to graduation, and with Bibby having done everything he needed to prove himself, he would declare for the 1998 draft as an NBA-ready point guard who could both score and distribute while possessing a great shooting stroke, as there was even a possibility he could go first overall. With the second pick in the 1998 NBA Draft, the Vancouver Grizzlies select Mike Bibby from the University of Arizona. Well, number two isn't bad, and Bibby would be going across the border to a Vancouver Grizzlies team who really needed to start making strides, as they were now going into their fourth year of existence. Bibby would join the Grizzlies frontcourt duo of Bryant Big Country Reeves and Sharif Abdurrahim, and would again be a day one starter. The Grizzlies were coming off their best season in their short history, but that would still be a season with only 19 wins. And although it would be a 50 game season due to the lockout, it was hoped they could at least match that win total, but they wouldn't even be able to get half the wins, as they finish 8 and 42. Bibby would have a great rookie season as he would finish 4th among rookies in scoring and 1st in assists, and would be the Grizzlies second leading scorer behind Abdur Rahim, while leading the team in assists and steals. He would hit double-figure scoring in 41 games and double-digit assists in 8 games, along with 6 double-doubles. But a big reason for the Grizzlies' step back was that Reeves, who had shown promise in his first three seasons, would really struggle with weight issues and a knee injury this season, which limited him to just 25 games, and show steep decline in his production. And Bibby's rookie season ended with him averaging about 13 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 6.5 assists per game, as he was named first team All-Rookie. The Grizzlies had the second overall pick for the second straight year and took the best player on the board in Maryland's Steve Francis, even though it was known that he did not want to play in Vancouver. And he would make that clear once the pick was official. So on August 27th, they orchestrated a three-team deal that sent Francis to the Rockets for a big package of players and picks. And among those players was Bibby's college teammate, Michael Dickerson. Reeves would return for 69 games in the 2000 season, but his short-lived best years were behind him, as he would put up career lows across the board. The Grizzlies featured four starters who averaged double figures and played all 82 games, with Abdur Rahim again leading the team, Dickerson finishing second, Bibby third, and another player acquired in the Francis trade, Othella Harrington, rounding it out. Bibby showed great improvement, as he improved his scoring on much more efficient shooting, but perhaps his most impressive improvement was his 8.1 assists per game, which would be 8th in the NBA. He would have 68 games in double figures, 24 games with at least 10 assists, and would record a triple-double. And the Grizzlies would finally crack the 20-win mark. But their bottom 5 scoring offense only helped them reach 22 wins, as they would continue to be one of the league's worst teams. One highlight of Bibby's year was that his improved long-range shooting got him a spot in the 3-point shootout, but he would be eliminated early. And his second season ended with him averaging about 14.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 8 assists per game. The Grizzlies would have the second overall pick for the third straight year and would select LSU's Stromile Swift, but he wouldn't have much of an impact this year. Reeves would play 75 games, but only start 48 of them, as he could no longer handle starter minutes, and would again put up less than 9 points per game. Abdur Rahim, Dickerson, and Bibby would again be the team's top 3 players, while Harrington was traded to New York on January 30th for Eric Strickland and Picks. Bibby again upped his scoring on over 45% from the field and nearly 38% from deep, and his 8.4 assists per game would be good for 4th in the league, as well as a career high. He would hit double figures in 70 games and have at least 10 assists in 23 games, including a career high 18 assists in an April 7th loss to Denver. The Grizzlies continued as a bottom 5 scoring offense and dropped to a bottom 5 scoring defense as well. They would make a 1 game improvement with 23 wins, but they were not making any progress. And on March 26th, the Grizzlies would apply to relocate to Memphis. And Bibby's season ended with him averaging about 16 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 8.5 assists per game. The Grizzlies were approved for relocation on July 3rd, but they would be starting their first season in Memphis looking like a much different team. About a week prior to the approval, on draft day, 
they traded Abdur Rahim to Atlanta, and on the same day, they would ship Bibby and Brent Price to Sacramento for Jason Williams and Nick Anderson. Williams had been a bit of fan favorite in Sacramento with his exciting play, but with this came a lot of bad decisions, which the Kings felt were holding them back from reaching the next level, as they were coming off a 55-27 and 27 season where they were swept by the Lakers in the second round of the playoffs. Bibby joined a Kings team featuring star Chris Webber, along with starters Vlade Divac, Peja Stojakovic, and Doug Christie, as he would be the final piece to the greatest show on court starting five. And the Kings also had a deep bench, featuring Bobby Jackson, Hito Turkoglu, and a rookie Gerald Wallace. Bibby fit in perfectly with the Kings' motion offense, and would be exactly what they needed at point guard, with his dual threat ability as a scorer and a passer, with a much better shooting stroke than Williams. Bibby would be third on the team in scoring, with all five starters putting up at least 11 points per game. As the Kings featured the second-ranked scoring offense in the league, Bibby would still hit double figures in 67 games, however would have just 4 games with at least 10 assists. But this drop was more due to the new offensive system he was in, under head coach Rick Adelman. Bibby's arrival would push the Kings to a new level, as they rattled off a 12-game win streak and went into the All-Star break winning 18 of their last 21. They would have another 11-game win streak near the end of the year, to finish with a league-best 61-21 record. Bibby had an up and down first round series versus the Jazz, as he started off with 20 points in a game 1 win, then would have just 5 in a game 2 loss. He would respond with a game high 26 in a game 3 win, before putting up another 5 point performance in game 4, which the Kings still won to advance to the second round. Bibby would again start slow with 11 points on 4 of 12 shooting in a game 1 win versus Dallas, but would play much better for the remainder of the postseason. He would score at least 22 points in the next four games of the Kings' five-game series defeat of Dallas, as he would finish as the team's second-leading scorer and top distributor, while shooting over 54% from deep, as the Kings advanced to the Western Conference Finals versus the LA Lakers. However, the Kings had lost Peja Stojakovic to a sprained ankle in Game 3 versus Dallas, which would keep him out of the first four games of the Conference Finals as well, and even when he did return, his mobility was hindered, which severely affected his play. The Lakers won Game 1 as Bibby struggled, shooting 7 of 21 from the field, but would then average 22 points over the next two games, which were both Kings wins. The Lakers would take Game 4 to even the series, but then Bibby would respond in the clutch in Game 5, as he hit a shot to put the Kings up by 1, with less than 10 seconds left, which ended up being the game winner, as the Kings were going into Game 6 with a chance to close out the series and make the finals. But then one of the most controversial games in NBA history occurred. Game 6 of the 02 Western Conference Finals is well known for the collection of head scratching calls and no calls, but the fourth quarter had the biggest discrepancy, as the Lakers would go to the free throw line 27 times in the quarter, with the Kings having 25 free throws all game. But even with this, the Kings kept it close, and had just put themselves within a point with under 15 seconds left to play. But then Kobe Bryant would elbow Bibby across the face as he was trying to get open for an inbounds pass. Yet no foul would be called, as they got the pass in, and the Kings had to foul which allowed the Lakers to put the game out of reach, and force a Game 7. Bibby would have a great Game 7 with a team high 29 points, but he would struggle from deep, going just 1 of 5, as the Lakers won by 6 points to eliminate the Kings, as their dream season had come to a shocking end, and Bibby's first season in Sacramento would see him average about 13.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. The 03 Kings would run it back with all the key pieces from the year prior, and added veteran Jim Jackson early in the year. Bibby had signed a 7 year extension in the offseason, however this would be the first time in Bibby's career where he would deal with injuries. He would miss the first 27 games of the year, after breaking his foot in the preseason. But the Kings were still able to go 21-6 in his absence. When he did return, he picked up where he left off, as he was again the team's third leading scorer on a career high 47% from the field and his first season shooting over 40% from deep. The Kings still possessed the top 3 scoring offense and would go 38-17 and 17 after Bibby's return, to finish the year at 59-23, and 23, which was good for 3rd in the Western Conference. They again began the postseason with a first round matchup versus Utah, who they would defeat in 5 games. Bibby wouldn't have a great scoring output this series, as he had just one game where he put up more than 12 points, but would distribute the ball well as he averaged over 6 assists while committing less than 2 turnovers per game. Then would come another second round matchup with Dallas. Bibby again struggled to score the ball this series as he started with just 7 points in a game 1 win, then would put up 9 points in a game 2 blowout loss. 
but it was during the third quarter of this game that the Kings were dealt their biggest blow. Weber had gone down with a knee injury, which would end up being a torn ACL ending his postseason, so it wasn't looking good for Sacramento. They would continue fighting and would force the series to go seven games, but Bibby wasn't producing as much as he needed to without the production of Weber, as in the first six games, he put up more than 13 points just once, had three games with single-digit scoring, and shot over 43% just once. He would finally break through and have his best performance in Game 7 by dropping a team-high 25 on 50% shooting. But a great game from Dirk and an overall great series from Nick Van Exel was too much for Sacramento as they lost Game 7, bringing their season to an end. And Bibby's year saw him average about 16 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. The Kings made some moves in the offseason that saw them acquire all-star center Brad Miller from Indiana in a sign-in trade. However, they would lose Turk Lou to San Antonio in the same deal. They were without Weber for the first three quarters of the year as he recovered from his ACL tear. And sixth man Bobby Jackson would also miss 32 games. So they were going to need more scoring from Bibby and they would get that as he would play and start in all 82 games while putting up a then career high 18.4 points per game which put him second on the team in scoring behind Stojakovic. Weber returned to play 23 games this year and was still putting up good numbers, as the Kings were able to maintain their scoring and finish with the second best scoring offense in the league to finish the year at 55 and 27. However, they would still be without Jackson for the postseason. They would get a rematch with Dallas in the first round and Bibby put together one of the best playoff series of his career. He would start slow in game one with 14 points on four of 14 shooting but after that would score at least 22 points in each of the next four games, which included his postseason career high of 36 points to go along with eight assists while shooting over 60% from the field and draining six threes in the Kings game five win to clinch the series. Round two brought a great Timberwolves team led by league MVP Kevin Garnett. And although this series would go the distance, the T-Wolves would defeat the Kings in seven games. Bibby's scoring would drop, but he would still be one of three Kings to put up at least 17 points per game. Although he would have four games shooting below 34%, he did start the series strong with 33 points, 7 assists, and 4 steals in a Kings win, but wouldn't crack 20 points the rest of the way. However, he would have three games with at least 10 assists as he averaged over 8 for the series, and for the regular season, he averaged about 18.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. It was going into 2005 when it became evident that this short era of great Kings basketball was coming to an end. The Kings let Divock walk in free agency and had also chose to leave Gerald Wallace unprotected in the expansion draft. They would start the year well and on January 10th were sitting at 21-11 and 11, when a deal was done that sent Christie to the Orlando Magic for shooting guard Catino Mobley. Then about a month and a half later, on February 23rd, they made the deal that officially ended the greatest show on court era. Five-time All-Star Chris Webber dealt by Sacramento to Philadelphia, the fourth trade and fourth NBA stop of his career. The Kings would receive a package of big men, with the most notable being Kenny Thomas, as he and Mobley would play well for the Kings the remainder of the year. So now the only starters left from their Western Conference Finals team just three years earlier were Bibby and Stojakovic. Stojakovic missed 16 games this year, but still led the team in scoring. However, Bibby played 80 games and again improved his scoring to finish as a close second, while also putting up his highest assist numbers since his Vancouver days. The Kings didn't have the same firepower, but still went 16 and 12 after the Weber trade to finish at 50 and 32 and earn another playoff berth. Bibby's improved year saw him put up double figures in 73 games, as well as his first career 40 point game in a February 4th win versus New York. He would have 13 double doubles on the season and one triple double as well. The Kings drew the Sonics in round one, and for the first time since Bibby arrived in Sacramento, he would be eliminated in the first round, as they lost to Seattle in five games. Bibby had a horrible game one, with three points on one of 16 shooting. He would improve to drop 16 in game two, and then a team high 31 in the Kings' lone win of the series in game three. And his best game would come in game five, when he had 35 points and 10 assists on over 54% shooting. But the Kings would still lose and be eliminated. And for his regular season, Bibby averaged about 19.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 7 assists per game. The 06 Kings would take another step back, as they would fail to reach 50 wins for the first time in 6 years. During the offseason, Bobby Jackson and Greg Ostertag were sent to Memphis for Bonzi Wells. And they lost Mobley to free agency. The Kings would sign Bibby's former Grizzlies teammate Sharif Abdurrahim, and had a second year shooting guard in Kevin Martin, 
who took a big step forward this year. Bibby's 21.1 points per game would be a career high and it would be the first and only time in his career that he led his team in scoring. Stojakovic was having a down year and with the Kings sitting at 17 and 24, they sent him to the Pacers for their troubled defensive star Ron Artest, leaving Bibby as the lone remaining starter from 2002. The Kings scoring offense had fallen to 10th in the league, but Artest's arrival helped them improve to the 17th ranked scoring defense. Bibby played all 82 games and would have 4 games with at least 40 which included his career high of 44 on 68% shooting in a January 24th loss to the Sixers. Overall, the Kings would finish 44-38, and 38, but would still make the playoffs and get a first round matchup with the defending champion San Antonio Spurs. Although the Kings would lose, they would still push the series to 6 games, versus a much better Spurs team. Bibby would again be up and down, as he would finish second on the team in scoring behind a great series from Wells. Bibby started strong, with 17 points on 50% shooting, but then put up 15 points on 3 of 16 from the field in Game 2. He would have 25 and 8 in Game 3, then 16 and 7 in Game 4, which were both Kings wins. But he would struggle the rest of the way, averaging 13 and a half points on a combined 10 of 30 shooting in Games 5 and 6. And his regular season would see him average about 21 points, 3 rebounds, and 5 and a half assists per game. Adelman was out going into 2007 and was replaced with Eric Musselman. The decline continued as they would have their first losing season since 1998. Bibby would again play and start all 82 games, but fall to third on the team in scoring behind great years from Martin and Artest. Additionally, he would average less than 5 assists for the first time in his career, and his 40.4% shooting would be a career low in seasons where he played more than 40 games. He still had some high points this season, like a career high 9 three-pointers in a March 25th win versus Phoenix, but even with Artest, the Kings had one of the worst defenses in the league, and would finish with a 33-49 and record to miss the playoffs. And it seemed like it would only be a matter of time before they looked to move Bibby as well. But for his regular season, he averaged about 17 points, 3 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game. Bibby would miss the beginning of the 08 season after injuring his thumb during an exhibition game. And when he did play, his numbers were way down from what fans had become used to. He would suit up for 15 games, but on February 16th, with the Kings sitting at 23 and 38, the final piece of their once great team would be dealt. Bibby was sent to Atlanta for a package of players and picks. The Hawks looked like an up and coming team with their star shooting guard Joe Johnson and their young front court consisting of the high flying Josh Smith and second year center Al Horford. Bibby joined a Hawks team who hadn't fared much better up to this point, as they were 22 and 28 at the time of the trade. Bibby would play every remaining game and although he no longer was expected to produce how he did in Sacramento, he did well in the new system and put up great assist numbers, as he provided the Hawks with a veteran floor general, and they would go 15-17 and 17 the rest of the way to finish the season at 37-45, and 45. and this would be enough to squeak them into the playoffs as the 8th seed, versus the first year of the Boston Celtics Big 3. The series was expected to be a cakewalk for Boston, but it was anything but that. The Hawks went down 0-2 before evening the series at 2 games apiece. Boston would take Game 5, but Atlanta would win Game 6, to force a Game 7. But this would end in a Celtics blowout win. Bibby really struggled this series, as although he had 4 games in double figures, he only shot above 36% once. And his overall regular season ended with him averaging about 14 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 6 assists per game. Bibby's first full season in Atlanta would be much improved. He would play in 79 games, and finish as one of 5 starters to average at least 11 points per game. Most impressive was how he took care of the ball, as he averaged a career low 1.6 turnovers per game, and would also have his most efficient shooting season in years. His 39% shooting from beyond the arc would help him earn a spot in his second career 3 point shootout, which he wouldn't be able to win. But the Hawks overall looked like a much better team, and were able to make a 10 game improvement on the season prior to finish at 47 and 35. They would get a first round matchup with the league's top scorer in Dwayne Wade and the Miami Heat. This would be another tough 7 game series, however this time, the Hawks came out victorious. Bibby played one of his best postseason series in years, as he finished 3rd on the team with nearly 15 points per game, and did so on over 47% from the field and over 53% from deep. Round 2 brought league MVP LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Hawks had no answer for him, as they were swept in 4 games. Bibby would take a slight step back, as he put up just about 10 points on less than 44% shooting but would shoot over 55% from deep and commit less than 2 turnovers per game. 
And Bibby's first full season in Atlanta saw him average about 15 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 5 assists per game. 2010 again saw Bibby play and start at least 80 games, but he would receive over 7 less minutes and average single digit shot attempts for the first time in his career. And this translated to his first season averaging less than 10 points and 4 assists per game. He shot less than 42% from the field, but was still a great deep threat at about 39%. The biggest addition the Hawks made was in acquiring Jamal Crawford in the offseason, who would win his first Sixth Man of the Year award while finishing second on the team in scoring. And even though Bibby had a lesser role, it was working for the Hawks, as they were one of the top teams in the East and would string together seven and six game winning streaks before the All-Star break to be sitting at 33 and 15. And they needed this, as they would go just 17 and 17 the rest of the way, but still finish the year at 50 and 32 and get a first round matchup with Milwaukee. For the third straight year, Atlanta would have a seven game first round series, and Bibby's lesser offensive role helped him put in another efficient series, as he averaged about 11 points on 46% from the field and over 44% from deep, and would only commit 10 turnovers across the seven game series, which the Hawks would ultimately win. Round two brought the defending Eastern Conference champion Orlando Magic, and Defensive Player of the Year Dwight Howard, and for the second straight season, they would be swept easily as they scored more than 85 points just once in the series. Orlando's defense shut down the entire Hawks team, and Bibby would be a starter, but receive less than 17 minutes per game, as he only put up 16 points throughout the entire series. And his regular season would end with him averaging about 9 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game. Bibby would be well-traveled in 2011. He would begin the season as a starter with Atlanta and play 56 games, as he put up similar numbers to the year prior but was shooting over 44% from deep. But then on February 23rd, Bibby was included in a trade to Washington. He would appear in just two games for the Wizards before agreeing to a buyout on February 28th, as he was hoping to join a contender. He would then sign with Miami and their big three on March 2nd for the remainder of the season. He would begin coming off the bench with Miami before becoming the starting point guard for the final 12 games of the season, as the Heat would finish 58 and 24. Bibby would remain the team starter throughout the playoffs, but was more of a spot-up shooter and facilitator for the big three. Unfortunately, Bibby would struggle throughout the postseason, as he put up about three points while shooting less than 22% in Miami's first round defeat of Philly. Round two would be much of the same, as he would average about three and a half points on less than 30% shooting in their defeat of Boston. The conference finals brought Chicago, and Bibby would contribute about four points per game, but would again shoot under 30%. Nonetheless, the Heat won and advanced to Bibby's first NBA Finals appearance, where he would be taking on a former Sacramento teammate. But it wouldn't end as he hoped, as Dallas defeated Miami in six games. Bibby showed slight improvement as he would put up about four points per game, but he would do so on his best shooting of the postseason at 35%. But sadly, Bibby would fall just short of a ring in a postseason he likely wishes he could have back. But for the regular season, he would play in 80 games, averaging about eight and a half points, two and a half rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. The Heat would elect not to re-sign Bibby, and after the lockout, he would sign on with the Knicks, which were also the team who had drafted his father nearly 40 years earlier. Bibby would join players like Carmelo Anthony and Amari Stoudemire, but see limited time initially, as he would be a backup during the stretch known as Lin Sanity. But after Lin went down with an injury, Bibby would see more action as a backup to fellow veteran Baron Davis, as the Knicks finished 36 and 30 and drew the Heat in round one. Bibby would come off the bench in the first four games, but would start Game 5 after a serious knee injury suffered by Davis in Game 4. Bibby had a decent series, putting up about 4 points while shooting about 39% from the field and 41% from deep. But the Knicks would fall in 5 games, and Bibby's regular season would see him average about 2.5 points, 1.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The Knicks chose not to re-sign Bibby, and his career would come to an end. He would later spend some time in the Big 3, before transitioning into coaching. Mike Bibby's career tends to be overlooked as he could never quite get over the hump and dealt with inconsistency in the playoffs. He was a really good point guard who was overshadowed by the great point guards of his era. The Kings face of the franchise was Chris Webber during their best team years and Bibby's short run as their top player came during a period of decline. He was everything you wanted in a point guard and had no problem playing his role. He was exactly what the Kings needed to push them into the NBA's elite and maybe would have a ring if things would have gone differently. Although Bibby was never quite a star in the league, it is still surprising that he didn't garner at least one all-star selection during his best years. 
but he's not the type of player to dwell over that, as he cared about winning and showed that from his earliest days in the national spotlight. He's one of those players that you had to see to understand, as his numbers don't jump out at you. But his ability to flow in the offense and fearlessness in taking the big shot made him a coach's dream. His durability and consistency is an accomplishment in itself, as Mike Bibby quietly put together one of the great underrated careers. But that's it for today's episode on Mike Bibby. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you like this video, check out this one on his Sacramento teammate. Or this one on his brief teammate in New York. Thanks for watching and see you next time.